The Star Wars universe is constantly expanding. But how the heck are you going to keep tabs on it without a holocron? And where in the rim can I score the juiciest news and rumors? Ah, you seek State of the Empire, Consequence of Sound's Star Wars Speculation Podcast, where we look for news in Alderaan places. We dig into the Sarlacc pit of the internet for the hottest intel in the galaxy far, far away. Make Indiana Jones inquiries and keep watch for the latest on Willow. Find us on consequenceofsound.net or wherever you procure fine podcasts. It's the show you're looking for. Consequence Podcast Network. Welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith With. It's an audio interview series presented by WFPK Independent Louisville at WFPK.org, Consequence of Sound, and the Consequence Podcast Network. Wherever you're listening from today, please do take a moment to hit the subscribe button to keep up with these interviews, whether you're checking out the podcast, listening on YouTube, or on Spotify. I'm Kyle Meredith. Today, my guest, the legendary Melissa Etheridge. It's been 25 years since her record, Yes, I Am, broke through in 1993, and we're going to talk about all the stuff that went into making that record, uh, the topics of the songs, and obviously a lot of her life surrounding that. We'll hear about how Yes, I Am is going to be reissued and some talk about women in festivals these days. It's an honor to talk to her, Kyle Meredith with Melissa Etheridge. Hi, Kyle. It's Melissa Etheridge. 25 years of Yes, I Am. I, I think that's what we're hitting on uh, the big part right now. Uh, that's, uh, that's a good old milestone right there. Yeah. I keep, <laughs> I keep going, really, 25 years? Man, that's, just, that's, that's kind of mind-blowing, but okay. And what a, what a landmark record. What a monumental record. And before we get into that, I, I looked, you know, leading up to that record, this was the fourth album in, in five years at that point, and that sounds completely intense. Did it feel that way? Well, you know what it felt like? It felt like I had finally gotten the break that I had always wanted. I mean, I was 27 when my first record came out, which is old by industry standards. And, and uh, uh, you know, and I had waited forever. And I had a bunch of songs just waiting to get out. So the second album was easy to go right back in and record that. And then, gosh, that was fun. And let me do a third. And so it's just, I, I, I was, you know, it was just me and my guitar, my love of the road. And so I, I would make a record, I would go tour, I would go back in and make another record and go tour. And, you know, it just would, it's, it was when I wasn't touring, I was recording and it was, come on, that was my dream come true. It's, you know, you're just thinking about, you know, I, the major labels, especially at that time had the machine was firmly in place. Like you put out the record, you do the two years of touring or whatever. And, and then you come back around right. and, and you just kind of blew past that, I guess. Yeah. I just, I, I was always sort of on my own, especially with uh Island records, an amazing record company, Chris Blackwell. he, he believed in me and, and really gave me all creative license. And he just supported me however I, I needed. And it was wonderful to, you know, not have to conform to anything that the record company thought, but they absolutely let me do my thing. And I did it. Yeah. And you'd had success coming into this. I mean, I think, I think you'd had a couple of Grammys already going into Yes, I Am. But obviously this was much bigger. When, when did you start to realize that this was going to be different than what had happened before? <laughs> You know, it, it took a while. It took a long while because, yes, I had a certain amount of success, and it was it was delightful. I had gold records, and I think uh, the first one eventually had reached platinum, and, you know, I was getting played on rock radio, but I hadn't broken through to that, you know, big pop goal in the sky. And what happened was Yes, I Am came out at the end of 93, and it took a year. It took 365 days for Come to My Window to even break the top 10, and it never hit number one and my album never hit number one but it broke records for being around the longest so it was just persistence that that just kept you know it was just one by one it was never this like overnight hit at all it was just a whole lot of work and that that lasted though until like i toured until 97 you know it it from 93 to 97 it grew and grew and became bigger and bigger and i even put another record out and that one so it was you know the mid 90s was huge for me but it took a long time for it to happen yeah right cuz if i wanted to wasn't even released as a its own standalone single until uh, 95 I mean that you're right. That that yeah. is a long. 
like when is this train going to stop? When is it time to get to the next one? Especially having released so many albums in succession like that, and suddenly, you know, that's what. Yeah, that's what I did. I went. I went back in and recorded the next album, and the record company was going to release a fourth single from Yes I Am, but then they saw, okay, we can release a new album, so they didn't. So Yes I Am could have gone on, you know, <laughs> and we could have, we could have, we could have done more, but we went ahead and with. Uh, your little secret and put that out. Now, that title, of course, has said a lot through the years to a lot of people. Yes, I am. It seemed to answer the big question that was lurking around for the few years before then about sexuality. Mm-hmm. I guess I, that's what I'm saying. It said a lot if it needed to, but I figure it probably said just as much about you, the person, beyond the sexuality and whatever. How much weight were you putting on that yourself? Oh, it's funny. The uh, the title, Yes, I Am, I, I was going to call it that before I came out. I mean, I and I also knew that I wanted to come out, that, that it was something that I was going to do on this album. And I think I was being kind of cheeky putting, you know, oh, I'll call it Yes, I Am. But the song itself, you know, the song Yes, I Am is about a declaration of love, a declaration of, you know, commitment. And, um, you know, that's kind of where, where it was coming from. But, you know, people took it however they wanted. Right, because, you know, it's now been written in history, you know, with everything that surrounds this album about your coming out, which, you know, in the early 90s is very different from today. You know, folks, of course, yeah, and that's nice. That's that's great to see that that history is finally caught up with humanity, I suppose. (laughs) But listening to this record, I mean, this was just as much just a relationship record as, as any artist could have written that. And that's that's what I sort of wondered, like, at the time, did it feel like a burden to also put this extra weight on it, you know, that that might have not been automatically placed there as you were writing it? Well, you know, I'll never know exactly what it was, but I, I chose at the time to think about it, and I still do, that the coming out was, yes, it was as much a burden, but the weight of that burden was also what propelled the curiosity, you know, what gave me more of a opening of people to talk about, you know, I think I got more press because of it. So I can't, you know, I can't ever say that it was, it held me back. I mean, I mean, I went from selling a million albums to 6 million nice. in, you know, America. So I, I, I can never complain. I think it was a combination of both. I, I, I'm sure there are people that I, actually, I, I still hear today people say, Oh, my, my parents wouldn't let me buy this album, you know, cause you were gay. And I'm sure that there were a lot of people that didn't listen to it that made that sort of statement. But I, I know there was a lot that, uh, you know, moved through that. So I think it was both a blessing and a curse. Why not? There's some songs on here beyond the singles that, you know, are still just as powerful today, like Silent Legacy. Uh, I went back and I was listening to that one again last night. It probably been a you know, couple of years since I'd heard that last. And, and, and kind of jumping on the web and still reading how so many people identify with that song in the various ways and how much it meant to them for, for you know, different reasons. How does that one sound to you these days? I mean, are you, are you playing all of this album live when you're doing it? I'm in in different places. I'm playing more of it. You know, it, it depends on the the show and the place. But boy, when I I do play Silent Legacy because that song was a was a very um very important song to to that album. And I tell you, when I do, it still crackles with being relative and and being important. It's still. I mean, I I was in Alabama. I did a show in Alabama, and the audience was just silent when I you know played that song. And and I realized it was you know cathartic for some people. For others, it was you know a question. And and so that it it still is. It still incites thought and reaction. And so you know we, we've got a long way to go, but it's. Uh, you know, it sure puts it out there front and center, though. Well, I mean, that's got to be what every artist wants, you know, to for the song to, to continue to have, you know, that connection and, and that type of, of relevancy. And uh, I even, you know, let me repurpose something for a second, because you take a song like Resist, which is about its own yeah. thing. You know, it's about a lot of the topics that we're talking about already. But in an age where that word means something completely different, you know, it feels like yeah. <laughs> there's a chance for it to have this whole new power to that. I don't know if that's been reflected or not. Wow, you know, I hadn't thought about that. That's funny because I do that. That's one that I do some nights and some nights I don't. But I haven't thought about that. That's the, ah, It puts a whole new spin on that, doesn't it? <laughs> You know, some of the lighter uh, stuff, um, you um, you know, you went up against Springsteen for best rock song in the Grammys. I mean, this was this was your hero, right? And and, and it was sort of the versus oh, thing. Man. Well, one thing I just uh, you know I got to say that the uh, the Grammys and the best female rock vocal that there was only I, I think 
maybe three or four times that that category was available. And then it just, they just closed it up and they threw all the women in with the guys. And I just think that that's, I mean, I never understood that. And, you know, they say, oh, there's not enough women doing, and I just, I mean, I look around and I see plenty of women. So um, I I don't understand why it's that. And it does, it puts me, you know, whenever I, I, I make it that far, it puts me, I'm up against Neil Young, I'm up against Tom Petty and, you know, Bruce Springsteen, and it's like, wow, <laughs> okay, all right. Well, you know, I'm honored, but still, it's it's a little crazy. I mean, it, it, there's, of course, uh, the movement right now about book more women in festivals. Brandy Carlisle's putting on where it's just women. Uh, I'm the same way. It, it, it's always seemed insane to me, knowing that there was an era, and by the way, there still is, I'm not going to brush over that, where radio programmers would be like, <laughs> oh, we have too many women in rotation. We can't do that. We can't play three in a row which is never a practice that we've had around here, but it's um, that's insane. I'm getting really off topic and going on a tangent, but it's still crazy to me. No, it, <laughs> it is true. It is true. I can tell you the first few albums of how many, I'm sorry, we're already playing a woman, you know, that sort of thing. And it's like, you know, what is that all about? You know, so the, you know, the women and, and we do fight. Rock and roll has been, it's like the last male bastion, you know, and, and to want to be, you know, considered and looked at, I, I, I know that, I know we can do it. I know that women have a lot of power in rock and roll because I just played a a festival up in Canada that was every night was headlined by a woman. Every single night. It was me. One night it was Cheryl Crow. Another was Pat Benatar. Another night. Every night. And for the first time in that festival's history, it sold out. You know, so, so this can work and it's, it's just a, it's a, it's a changing of an old guard of an old mind. And, and it's, you know, year by year, I think it will change. And, And again, People will look back in 10 years and go, really? Yeah. It wasn't always like this? Right. Like, no. <laughs> There's so much, so many great moments on, on that record, too. What is is there anything left in the vault for this one? It, it, you know, is there still stuff left over that didn't make the record? They're going to put out, uh, in November, we're going to put a reissue of the album out, and it's going to have seven uh, unreleased tracks. These are these are tracks that uh, that have been sitting around in the vault that didn't get put on the album. And you know, I go back and listen, and I don't dislike them as much as I used to. You know, <laughs> that they didn't make the record. So you know, you, you know, you, you get forgiving and go, oh, that was nice. That's good. And so the fans are going to really love that. I'm excited to hear that too. And as far as the new record, that hearing you say that word, uh, that phrase is exciting too. Does that mean there's one around the corner as well? Yes, yes. I've, it's coming. I've finished it it's mick and it will be out in the uh january the beginning of uh, 2019 and, and it's just a it's a straightforward melissa etheridge rock album it's songs that i sat and wrote and then i played and recorded with john shanks my old buddy and and i'm i'm so excited about it so we're gonna hear that uh, sometime next year Yes, sir. I I'm, can't wait. All right. Neither can I. And uh, hopefully we'll get to talk about the new music at that point. Uh, Melissa, thank you so much for taking the time to talk about Yes, I Am. And by the way, happy birthday to the self-titled debut record, too, because it turns 30 this year. And uh, that's still a great one as well. Yay. <laughs> they oh, keep thank aging. you very, very much. I appreciate it. All right. Take care out there. We'll see you soon. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. And a big thanks to Melissa Etheridge talking 1993's Yes, I Am. Looking very forward to the next record as well. Uh, If you haven't already, please do take that moment to hit the subscribe button wherever you're listening to, whether it's on YouTube, uh, whether you're getting your podcast from iTunes, Podchaser, or if you're listening on Spotify right now, please do hit that follow button on there as well. After that, you can head over to WFPK.org. That's where I do a show every Monday through Thursday from noon to 3 Eastern, and where you'll also find some bonus episodes of this series. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time. Consequence Podcast Network.